Um, I'm a nurse by trade and I've worked in intensive care for, for 30 years, so I've done a few ECGs in my time. Is um, at what stage in your development are you, are the, are you the students now? Somebody tell me. So they've not been out on placement yet, but we're preparing them for placement. Um, but part of the one of the questions we've seen on one of the exams that have been released for us to view is around ECG. So we just thought it'd be useful to have this video just to concrete that learning in. Fantastic, um, because I do work with the cadets, the trainee um, nursing associates and the cadets in the hospital as well. So brilliant. And um, this is the basic um, anatomy and physiology we use for staff to be able to perform an ECG. Now, one of the things we've got to make very, very clear is that performing an ECG is not interpreting an ECG. Um, our whole priority is making sure we get um, an accurate ECG so we can make an accurate, accurate diagnosis and give the correct treatment. And there have been incidences where the ECG has been put on wrong. We're doing a massive drive at the moment that any level of nurse or every nursing associate or support worker, all staff are going to be able to perform ECGs because it's an everyday skill now. It used to be very specialised many years ago, but it's, it's not now. So at the end of this session, I'm hoping that the learner will have some theoretical knowledge to record an ECG. So a little bit about anatomy and physiology and what creates the ECG waveform. Um, but the main thing is, is how to perform one. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So your responsibilities when we're performing an ECG and when we go through um, these, I'd like you know to open the forum for people to make suggestions themselves and, and guess what they may be. It's not about me just talking to yourselves. Understand why we perform an ECG. Have you got some ideas why we do that? Um, the functions of the heart and its electrical activity. So just so we have an understanding what's creating that first part of the ECG, i.e. the P wave, then the Q, the R, the S and the T. And if we know what's creating that, we'll know what's normal. That's the only thing we need to know so that when we've got the ECG, the machine interprets it very well, but we want to make sure our patient's safe and we're not left them in a life-threatening rhythm. So you must be able to describe a waveform. You might not be able to do it today, that's fine, but this is the start of your process of developing. Able to troubleshoot an ECG machine. We won't be able to do that today. That won't be an objective because we've not got an ECG machine with us. You need to be in practice to do that. Um, and have an understanding of the correct electrode placement. You're surprised where people think electrode placements need to go. Um, and a lot of people guess, but there is an accurate placement. And this is what's vital because if these are done wrong, then we'll get a misdiagnosis on the ECG and the patient could get the wrong treatment. And that's what the ECG technology's biggest fear is by delegating that to us. OK, but I'm sure you'll be fine. Next slide, please. <coughs> OK, so um, actually we can miss this slide. This is a slide that we'd use if we was in practice, so we're not going to do that. So what do you think? What can can we can we open the forum to people talking to me now and give me some ideas? What do you think would be important for you as a as a student, as a learner? What would be your responsibility approaching a patient? Any ideas? We've got a an uh, idea. Go on then, give us some please. The Eve just said that so they feel safe. Oh, good one. Like that one, Eve. Well done. Yeah. Any more? Picture if you was in that bed and somebody was approaching you to do this, what do you think you'd need? Do we know what an ECG is? Maybe I'm being a bit presumptive. Someone's just said that they feel supported, so the patient would feel supported. Excellent, excellent. Good stuff. Good stuff. Do you know that we have to take people's clothes off to do it? 
So if one to, after, if I had to take some of your clothes off at your top half of your body, what would you like? What would you feel that you would need? Privacy. Excellent. We call it privacy and dignity. Yeah, that's part of our um, holistic approach and part of our strap lines for our um, um, patient needs. So privacy and dignity. Um, what else? Our students are very same patients, so be patient with the patient. Oh, I like that one. Yeah, be patient. Yeah, you, these are all very good things, humanistic things, because trust me, there are some people out there who wouldn't think of these things, which are very important. So you, you're brilliant. Anything else? For me, um, I'd want to be warm. Yeah. I wouldn't like you to come and take all my covers off me and leave me exposed. I'd like the curtains round. So you've mentioned safe and privacy and supportive. So what we do is make sure the curtains are round. Um, I'd like you to, obviously to be patient with me. So I'd need somebody to explain to me what we're going to do so I can get what's called consent. Have you gone through consent yet? Yeah. We have at Hopwood Hall. Yeah, we Excellent. have very. So tell, tell me about what, what consent means to you then, if I rock up with an ECG machine and say I'm going to do an ECG, what types of consent is there? It, we've got a few suggestions, informed consent. Fantastic, anything else? You're right, there's another one though. We're saying it very autonomous, so let them choose whether they want it done or not. Fantastic. And there's what we call inferred consent. So you rock up and say, I'm going to do an ECG and a patient doesn't stop you. They just lie there. And trust me, the patients will let you do a lot of things to do them because they trust us in our uniforms. And it's only afterwards that they say, oh, if I'd have known it was going to be that, I wouldn't have had it done. So we need to explain to them what we're going to do um, and explain, reassure them, as you said, be support them. It's not going to be painful um, and that it will it'll only take a short time. And it's taken an electronic picture of their heart. So we've got inferred consent, informed consent. And we do have some leaflets that you can give to them. We might need, have you heard of a chaperone? Anybody? We've not yet? covered it. We've not quite covered chaperones yet. We've not got to that part of. Um, well, I'll, bri I'll, I'll briefly mention chaperone then. Sorry, what was that? I just I'll said we've not. I've not covered it yet. Okay. So we briefly mentioned chaperone and there's two types of chaperone from our perspective. There's one that where we need a professional chaperone because uh, the uh, professional is worried about uh, the patients misunderstanding what the nurse is doing to them. And then there's the chaperone for the patient's needs. So is it, um, is it a language barrier? Um, is it a mental capacity barrier? Um, is it pure fear? So do you want your mum there or you want your dad with you um, or a professional chaperone is that it has to be someone who knows how to perform an ECG so that they can ensure that the ECG is being performed correctly because obviously it is quite intimate when you touch especially females to apply the ECG probes. So the level of undress um, is, is appropriate. They don't have to be completely naked, but unfortunately there is a misconception that you can do them with bras on. You can if they've got metal in them because it, the ECG will pick up that metal uh, and it will give you a false reading. Skin prep, you don't have to you know, um, be completely bald. You don't have to do loads of shaving. Um, the skin does have to be clean and you do have to get good contact with the electrodes. But look at that. You've mentioned that people have got to be safe and private. It's got to be somewhere quiet with the curtains round. The patient's um, not got to be anxious. But the biggest, biggest thing for me that I promote with all the staff that go to a, a patient to do an ECG is that they look OK. If they look distressed, sweaty, clammy, in pain, um, breathless, then they must go and get help straight away. 
because um, it'd be misfortune to be misfortunate to be doing an ECG on a patient who's actually um, distressed and having a heart attack and nobody's sorting them out. I know we need an ECG, but that's not a priority. The priority at that time is you've got some help and that patient is getting the treatment they need. OK, um, and then we've got um, health and safety issues, so infection control. So make sure you've got apron on, gloves on um, a mask on if you're within um, two metres of the patient. And if it's a COVID patient, then there'll obviously be all the COVID restrictions and um, 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 what do you call it? <laughs> Gone blank. Um, equipment that you're going to need to wear. Make sure the bed's at the right height and make sure you've got everything as you approach the bedside. And it's always really important to know um, who's requested the ECG. Has anybody got anything to say so far? You OK? OK, you slide, please. So here you can see um, some of the equipment that we're going to need. Um, all the ECG machines, what we're trying to do across the whole Northern Care Alliance is standardise um, the one type of ECG machine. And this is a big aim, this is a big goal, um, but these machines do diagnose um, the ECG recording and they do store them electronically into patients' notes. Um, so we're trying to, uh, a big project is to get these um, ECGs in place. Um, the cables and the electrodes, this is the most not difficult, it's very easy to do, but this is the one where human error will, can come into place very easily because these leads can be placed in the wrong place um, and we're going to go through placement shortly. Um, if we have to shave a patient, then then we have to, but it's only just slightly now. The new stickers that we have are fantastic. They'll stick unless the person is abnormally hairy, um, but um, obviously, we have to seek consent to shave somebody. I've never had anybody decline, never. And then obviously we need to make sure there's paper in the machine. OK, next one. So why would and why do you think? Ooh, why do you think we perform ECGs? Why do you think we do them? Can you shout out for me? We got go on in. She said heart attack. Oh, excellent. Yep. Um, so it's not only the heart attack, but it's which part of the heart is not getting a blood supply. So we, we nine times out of ten presenting with chest pain will be the indicator, but we need to know which artery is blocked or is it fat or is it blood and um, which part of the heart is um, uh, a problem. So yes, heart attack. Any other ideas? The rhythm of the heart. Brilliant, yeah. Have we got a normal rhythm? Is it beating correctly in the first place? So we do uh, for a couple of reasons for the rhythm. One for a baseline. So if you go in for surgery, we want to know that your heart is beating normally. And then post-surgery, is it still beating normally? And throughout the surgery, you'll be on an ECG machine. So we want to check that you didn't have any problems with your heart prior to surgery. And then there's lots and lots of different reasons why somebody might have a problem with their heart um, beating uh, to detect arrhythmias and um, gain the baseline, as you can see that slide there. Yeah. So we and also with the elderly, do we is the heart getting thicker and bigger? Um, do we need to know? Surprisingly, the sugars and the salts, you know, the electrolytes, they can cause your heart to beat abnormally. So if we had um, uh, de deranged electrolyte balance, the sugars and the salts, then we do an ECG to see if it was affecting the heart. And lastly, on that slide there, um, if we put a pacemaker here in, they have to come back regularly to check that the pacemaker is doing the job it's supposed to be doing. So lots of reasons, really. Um, and we find now it's an everyday occurrence. Just like having your bloods done when you walk into hospital or having your blood pressure done, it's a baseline um, observation now to perform an ECG. And this is why we're upskilling the majority medical students, nursing students, qualified staff, unqualified staff to perform an ECG. So lots of reasons. Thanks for shouting some out there for me. Next slide. 
So um, it's a bit busy, this picture. Very busy indeed. Now, if it was in the classroom, what I would do is I'd, I would draw an ECG over that. But obviously, um, I don't know how to do it through um, Teams. But um, can everybody see the right ventricle? Yeah. This is where the heart, um, the pacemaker of the heart is in. The next slide is going to show this as well. But this is where the first electrode comes from here, the P wave. And then it sends impulses all across the atria. And then here is the AV node, atrial ventricular node. So this is, gives the second part, part of the picture of a ECG. And then it goes all the way down the middle of the heart. And that gives that huge output, that huge T, um, RST wave. And then it relaxes and starts again. Um, and the heart's in four chambers um, with a, a dividing corridor um, between the two, two sides. And they, they have to beat rhythm together in rhythm. If it starts to beat abnormally, all these um, valves that are stopping blood from backflowing or from filling up, it will it just become a dysfunction. So it's really important that the electric uh, the electrical activity is working correctly. Next slide, please. There, that's what I've just tried to describe to you. So there's what will be the P wave. I'll show you the waves in shortly. There's going down to um, the start of the, the Q wave. Then it goes all the way down the heart and gives us this big ST, this big output, because the ventricles are the biggest heart part of the heart muscle. And then this nice relaxation phase, T wave where everything relaxes. And this is called um, the bundle of hiss and the Purkinje fibers. This isn't where the arteries and the veins are that get blocked. This is purely the electrical activity. Surprisingly, if you took that heart, if you took a heart out and put it in a bucket with the right saline and salts and sugars, it'll beat on its own. It's got its own inherent rate. It's a wonderful piece of uh, piece of anatomy. Next slide, please. So you can see here. OK, this just uh, it's giving us um, it's called a 12 lead ECG, but it's actually giving us um, you only put 10 leads on and only nine of those work, but you get 12 pictures. There's one picture. There's two picture. There's three. Then you've got where you put the six. Look, um, uh, dots on across the chest. This is giving you those six pictures. Can you see that? And then we've got these last three here. So that's nine, yeah, at 12. And then this last one all across here is an actual rhythm strip. And we can see there's the P wave, there's the Q, the R, the S, and the T. So there's where the atria first started pumping. There's where it went to the AV node. There's where it went all the way down into the ventricles. And there's where the heart started to relax. And that's all we're looking for. It's got a P wave, a Q, a Q wave, an R, an S and a T. We're not interpreting at all. We're just making sure that we've got all these nicely on the on the graph paper. One thing we need to do, though, is make sure the graph paper, the graph is always set out the same. So it's all, the speed's always 25 and the electrovolts are 10. And you'll see the nurses setting those. When you come into the hospital, um, every time a nurse does an ECG, come along and work with her and even ask if you can do them. They'll gladly teach you how to do them. I've got a video for you. And this is just explaining um, about the cardiac, the cardiac cycle, um, why we're putting these, um, how the heart is working and why we're putting these leads on.
Now, if if we don't have a normal conduction system, if for whatever reason the conduction system isn't working, incorrect salts and sugars are, block in the, are blocking the arteries, then um, that cardiac cycle is not going to work and a person's blood pressure is going to fall dramatically and the person's going to collapse and could possibly have heart damage done uh, tissue to their tissue. The next slide is going to um, discuss the, um, the alternative. No, you're not going away. This one is going to um, illustrate how the ECG is working, how it's making that cardiac cycle work. Sorry, I'm not very good with technology, as you've probably just discovered. I'll try the next video now. Are you? Oops. I genuinely, do you want me to start resharing the screen again? Yes, please. Sorry. Right, it's all right. Can you cancel your screen sharing then? I will do if I can get out of here. <laughs> Bear with me. Thank you. Right, let me try again. Hang on, I'm trying to cancel there. There we go. Right, and back. Right, what video was we on? The second video. The second video, please. Right. Technology. That's a, that's it. This one, please. I'll try again.
Fantastic. Next slide, please. OK, so an ECG is making an assessment of the conduction sequence, the P, Q, R, S, T. If there's something wrong with the P wave, what part of the heart is there going to be something wrong with? Does that, can anyone, just that be what, what's just been explained? Did that make sense to you? Could anybody answer? Still there? Yeah, we're still here. I've just got a lot of blank faces at the moment. Right, no, but no, no problem. I'll, I'll carry on. I'll carry they're, on saying, they're saying the um, SA node here. Um, oh, right. and they are spot on. Brilliant. So that means that the top part of the heart isn't working, and that's the atria of the heart. So the atria can't fill with blood and then go on to fill up the ventricles. So you can see how this electrical activity can give us a view of what's happening inside the heart without having to go. Um, and look inside. So well done. It's going to show us how the conduction sequence is working. Do we get the P, Q, R, S, T all in that order? Is it going in the right way or is it being deflected off, deflected off because there's been a heart attack? Have we got the right rate and the rhythm? Um, does anybody know what a normal heart rate should be? We've got between 60 and 80. Brilliant. So 60, 60 to 100 is normal. Below 60 is called a bradycardia. That means it's too slow. And above 100 is called a tachycardia. That means it's too fast. If it's too slow, the heart, the, you're going to get deoxygenated over time because the heart's not beating fast enough. And if it's too fast, you'll get deoxygenated because the chambers can't fill up and beat blood. So it's important. So when we get, we want to get, make sure that these ECG leads are put on properly so the machine and the doctors can work out the sequence, the conduction and the direction and the rate and the rhythm of that heart. Next slide, please. So that's the overview of it. That's a normal ECG. And when I showed you the pink ECG printout and at the very bottom was a long um, strip, that's what you've got to get used to seeing. And that's the only um, thing you've got to look at on the ECG and then check that the patient's not in any distress so that you can walk away safely and leave that patient and then give the ECG to the person who requested it then you would document that you perform the ECG and that the, the form was given to the um, doctor or nurse or advanced practitioner who requested it. And then the machine um, can be transferred to their electronic notes. Cool, absolutely cool system. So we've got the P, that's the atria, the Q, which is the next AV node, the R and the S, which is part of the ventricles going down the bundle of Hiss, and then this T wave, this going all through the atria and the ventricles and starting to relax to the next wave. OK, if the heart, if any of those beats come in too soon, it can send the person into life threatening rhythms. So we need to do ECGs and check everything. Next slide, please. We don't have a workbook for this. Sorry, I'm using this presentation that I use in work. Um, we won't be having a break, I'm sorry, uh, as much as I've got my cup of coffee here. Um, I've just explained that to you, so next slide. As I said, we put we don't put 12 leads on, we put 10 leads on and we get 12 views. So we put um, four limbs on and if you can remember this, ride your green bike. So R is for red, which is for right, and the, the limb leads are red. Your is for yellow and it's got an L in it, which is for left. So that's for your, for your left arm. Green is for your um, left leg and bike black is for your right leg. So we always promote the staff to remember ride your green bike. So that's right arm, left arm, left leg, right leg. 
and then the six chest leads. This is the one that we've got to get really correctly uh, in place. The limb leads are placed at the ends of the limbs. It should be at least 15 centimetres away from the heart. So ideally on the wrist and ankles. Obviously, if somebody's got an amputation or anything, then uh, further down the um, stump as possible. Uh, they can be placed on shoulders, but ideally they should be placed on the extremities of the ankles and the, the wrists. But obviously, sometimes we have to deviate from that. OK, next, next slide, please. Now, can you see here? This is quite important. This is the bit you have to get used to feeling. Now, if I was in a classroom with you, I'd be promoting you all now to touch your own chest, not somebody next to you. I don't know if you can see me on the screen. Um, go to the top of here of your clavicle. There's a big dent in here. Yeah, and then in this first bone you can feel is your clavicle. And then that space underneath it, that's called the apex of your lungs. There's nothing in there. Your heart isn't in there. Your heart is two thirds down in your chest and mostly on the left hand side. It's about the size of your fist. So we don't want this space up here. But the next thing you can feel, and if you use the flat of your finger, not the tip of your finger, you can feel the first rib. Just out of interest, are you trying this? Yeah. OK, so we've got first rib, first space, second rib, second space, third rib, third space, fourth rib, fourth space. And that's where V1 goes on the other side of your sternum. But you'll come and practice this when you're in the hospital. And if you see any of the training days, you can come up, come over on them. It's not a problem and practice on the dummies that we've got. So V1 goes on the fourth intercostal space. And V2 goes on exactly the same side, fourth intercostal space on the opposite side of the sternum. Now you haven't got X-ray eyes, so you've got to go by your judgment of feeling. We don't put V3 on yet. We miss V3 and we go straight for V4. And V4 is the middle of your clavicle. So that big bone at the top. <coughs> and it's the fifth intercostal space. Then we put V3 on anywhere between V2 and V4. Then we miss V4 and go to V6. And it goes under the armpit right in the middle of the armpit, horizontal, on line with V4. And V5 goes exactly in between V4 and 6 at the front of the armpit, the anterior of the armpit. So they're actually in a straight line, but a lot of the diagrams look like it's um, going round in a semicircle and that's not right at all. That's exactly where the bottom of the heart will be and you can see round the heart. Right, and I'm going to give you an example of this, why you're doing this, uh, what view you're going to get. If I've got a cup of coffee this morning and I go out into my garden and I look at my um, greenhouse from the front, looking at my greenhouse, I can see my sweet peas and I can see my tomatoes and my potatoes. But I can't see around the side. I can't see where my cucumbers are and um, my carrots. And I can't see around the other side where my dahlias are and my geraniums. But if I get a stepladder and go on the roof and look down through my um, greenhouse, I'll be able to see exactly what this 12 lead ECG is going to see. And it's called Eithoven's Triangle. And it gives us a view, 12 views all the way around the heart as if it was looking on top like 3D images, it's fantastic, but these leads have to be in this correct order. When you come into the hospital, um, you can come up to the labs, you can ask the staff to help you to put them on. There's loads of ways that you'll learn. OK, next, next slide, please. There's where your limb leads go. Remember, ride your grip, and that's what I've just explained about Eithoven's triangle. It's just like looking, putting those leads on the way you have done. It's just like looking through a greenhouse at the top, looking down 
into your greenhouse and you can see everything. So you're looking down, you're looking above your heart and you can see where all this electrical activity is going. And that's from these 12, these six leads you're going to put on and the limb leads. The picture is going to bounce every way. How cool is that? Yeah. That will give you this ECG strip. Now, you're not to worry about interpreting these at all. They, you've got to be highly skilled. There's only doctors and advanced practitioners and heart care nurses and ICU nurses that learn this skill. Um, and with, in time, you'll get used to seeing them. But you've just got to make sure that rhythm strip at the bottom, that one continuous strip, that you can see that it, it looks steady. And the main thing you're looking at is that the patient's not in any pain, so you can say safely leave them. OK, reading an ECG strip is not part of this session. OK, um, the times that you have a variation from doing that as if we wouldn't put the leads on in that particular way, as if somebody's heart was on the right hand side instead of on the left. And if somebody's heart was the wrong way round. But if that was the case, then we'd ask for an ECG technician to perform that ECG. We wouldn't do that as nurses. OK, next slide, please. Good positioning. Um, making sure that the leads are on correctly. Some patients could be shivering. As you can see, that top ECG there, that's actually muscle tremor. So all that, what could people might, uh, some misdiagnosis could be made that that's the P waves. It's not, that's actually muscle shivering because the patient's cold. Or if they've got Parkinson's, you know, because they, they, they're tremoring all the time. So what we try to do is make sure they've had the Parkinsonian drugs and lay the hand flat just slightly and tuck them under the buttocks so that they can stop stop tremoring and obviously cover them up. Um, put a, I usually put a, tea, um, a pillowcase over the women because obviously the um, ECG leads are on top of my sheets. Um, muscle tremoring, if they're frightened, um, lots of reasons, if they're cold, as I've just said. The lead underneath says electrical interference. Now, when you go to mo at most bedsides now, uh, there's a lot of electrical equipment there. The mattresses are electrical because um, they're air, they've got air cells moving up and down. The feeding pumps are electrical. In ICUs, you've got the kidney machines and the heart machines and all sorts of things. So um, we might have to change the settings on the machine to do that. Again, that's when we get an ECG technician. So we don't want any electrical interference. We don't want any muscle tremor in. And ideally, that last, that last picture is what's called an artifact. That's the patient talking, taking a big deep breath in. That's where you can see the dip. And then all that shimmering is where he's, he or she is talking. So you usually hear them saying, can you just be quiet, please, just for a minute while I do this and um, stop the artifact so that the ECG machine can interpret it properly and you can see the whole PQRST complex. Next slide, please. Now this is going to be a demonstration. This is a beautiful um, uh, Video we made last year because um, this is all e-learning for us now until we have a practical session and this lady is an ECG technologist who is going to explain um, where the leads go. OK, so that's just getting the placements ready for the dots. Next slide, please. That should be next slide. That's it.
Next slide. <clears throat> Next slide. OK, um, and uh, next slide, please. That's what we would do here. There's no more slides after that one. Right, that's it. Brilliant, that's the end of it. So um, those ECG placements, if you want me to send you some, um, I can send you tutors, uh, some printouts that we have um, uh, that are really good and they're in colour. Um, and the logistics of using the machine, there's no point in talking about the machines because they're all very different. Um, but as we've emphasised and shown where the ECG um, leads go and using that um, acronym Ride Your Green, Ride Your Green Bike, um, it does work very effectively here. Has anyone got any questions? No, we have no questions here. OK, I've not confused anybody. No questions from us, thank you. OK, well, I'd like to say uh, thank you for joining me today. Um, I'd like you to do an evaluation if you can with your tutor for me. To let me know if um, it was what you needed or give me some suggestions how I could make it better. And I uh, hope to see you um, in Salford Royal someday. You'll have to let me know who you are because I've not seen any faces. But good luck in your career and thank you for joining me. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.